Yeah, Friday. So, I want to hear, how are you guys doing Don't Bullshit Me? More, please. Thank you. That's close enough. So, one of the tenants that I do is, a, I, I'm a death metal fan, and so the death metal fans are really, really loud. So, I'm going to ask one more time, for my panelists especially, and myself, of course, because why not, how the hell are y'all doing? <laughs> That's more like it. First question, is anybody in this room under the age of 21 or 18? Raise your hand, please. So, so, um, because I want to moderate my language. That's why. Second question. You want to your language. Pardon? You want to immoderate your I really don't, actually, but, I mean, whatever. <laughs> Second question. So, how many of you are aiming for professional status as writers? Raise a show of hands. So most of you, if I understand correctly. Uh, to preface this, I don't see well, so one of these guys will tell me. Yes, most of us are professional. How many of you are hobbyists? So when I say hobbyist, you're not aiming to make money. You just want your work out there. Is that correct? Uh, you in the back there with the hair? Yes. So your, your goal is just to get your artwork out there, yes? Yes. Excellent. Okay. So a minority of hobbyists, which is cool, we got you covered, and a majority of want to be professionals or potentially professionals or professionals, yes? Yep. Okay, cool, cool. So, uh, my name is Sasha Levich. I'm going to start this off with introductions. So, from the left, and then I'll come. Uh, my name is Mallory Whitfield. I am based in New Orleans, and I've been sort of internet obsessed since like 1994. I kind of grew up on the internet, and I've been doing various forms of social media marketing for the last decade or so. I worked for the last three and a half years at an agency in New Orleans called FSC Interactive that specializes in social media marketing, digital marketing, and I recently became the director of marketing at Look Far, which is a tech startup studio in New Orleans. And one of the ways that I taught myself social media marketing is I've run various forms of my own businesses since about 2004, mostly specializing in handmade products and craft shows and things like that. And that's actually my self-published book is a nonfiction book called How to Make Money at Craft Shows. It started as various blog posts and then I turned it into that. So I'm probably coming at social media marketing and book sales at a little bit of different angle than the rest of the panelists, but happy to share with you guys. Real quick before other, our next guest come up, can y'all come closer? If you're in the back, come closer, please. We want to get a tight. We're we're writers are family because we're all very lonely in the end of the day. And come closer, please. We don't bite much. Our, well, our I do. Characters do, but we, you know. <laughs> oh well. If you ask for it, I do. Thank you, fine folks. With all due respect to my next panelist. Uh, I'm Jim Nettles. By profession, I do business and technology consulting. I do fiction and nonfiction. Uh, as an author, I do a lot of content, um, for both for clients. I do have a lot of uh, a lot of my fiction I publish under James P. McDonald. Um, oh, I know you. Yes, <laughs> it's the witch me is here, um, and witch me is talking at the time. And which me is being a smart ass at the time. Um, and, and I have a new, uh, a new project going on that's called The Writer's Mind that is about business for authors and creatives. Uh, it's the first book in the series, should be out hopefully by the end of the year. It's in betas right now, getting ready to go to editing. Uh, the, I usually get blog posts up about three weeks out of four. I've got some guest posts getting ready to start stacking up that's actually geared towards the business side of it. Um, so if anybody's interested, I do have cards up here if you want to come check those out. Hi, I'm Gail C. Martin. I write epic fantasy, urban fantasy, and steampunk, uh, mostly for Solaris books and Orbit books. The new series there, uh, Darkhurst, with the first book Scourge, just came out in July from Solaris books. Also have a new series, uh, Mike Wojcik, Monster Hunter, starting with Spell, Salt, and Steel from Falstaff books next month. Um, that's on the writing side of my life. On the other side, uh, my MBA is in marketing. I spent 17 years running corporate communications and marketing departments for companies and nonprofits. Um, I've written two book. I've written six books on social media. Uh, 30 Days to Social Media Success m was named by Lifehack to be one of the top 20 business books to read in 2016. The brand new book, 
The Essential Social Media Marketing Handbook just came out in May of this year from Career Press. I do have a couple of copies with me for sale. Uh, it's not in the vendor room, but I've got them if you catch me after the panel. And it's all about why the stuff you're doing on the internet last year isn't working this year and what to do instead. Excellent. Love it. My name is Sasha Oyevich. I'm a romance author. I've been published for the last almost 20 years. I am represented by Marissa Corvisiero Agency and publicity by, oh shit, because uh, <laughs> it's been a minute since we talked. Uh, I've got publicity either way, but I've been in this industry for 20 years almost and looking at different things and watching the changes grow, or changes happen anyway, and seeing what's going on in the industry. So let's get into that real quick. So the first question I have for you guys is, Amazon has really screwed things up. Now, to tell you guys a little secret, I've been looking at investing in Amazon, and truth be told, looking at their 10K form, they're only making about 20K a year profit. All right? So that being said, how are you guys dealing with Amazon and the SEO factor? Well, I think it depends, you know, especially if you're looking at Facebook advertising, it's really changed. Um, it, Facebook pulled kind of a number on us um, and screwed us over pretty well. Um, it, you, several years ago, Facebook launched what they called business pages, fan pages. They wanted you to move your discussion about whatever it was your business was into a business page and keep the personal stuff on fan pages. And the whole idea was that if you encouraged people to follow you on the business page, then that's where they could get their news from you. And all was well and good until they decided, well, you know what, this is too easy. Now we're going to cut the organic reach of your business page. So right now, the organic reach on your business page is about 1% to 3%. Organic means that's what you get without paying extra money. So you've invested all this effort and sometimes advertising money into getting people to like your business page, but now Amazon holds that audience hostage unless you pay more money for every message you want to have reach more than 3% of your audience. Not only that, but when you pay for those boosted posts, it's kind of like the first hit from the drug dealer on the playground. You know, the first hit is free, it does really, really well, but then every hit thereafter doesn't get you nearly as high. I love the drug references here. So <laughs> and truth be told, I've seen that happen. There's a author, Sherry Wasick, did a Facebook class for us recently on Amazon ads mm -hmm. and how to work that. So we'll talk about that in a minute too. Yeah. So it has become harder to get the same reach with paid advertising on Facebook. Um, and I'll talk later about Twitter. It's Twitter so far hasn't pulled the rug out from under us, but there are some caveats there too. But they're cucked. There, they, there are some caveats there. So yeah, and, and one of the things by nature what I do, and I, I've done work for some of these companies over time, uh, from an e-commerce standpoint, I've built a lot of my career in e-com. Um, and going back, I sold my first system when I was 14, back when you know I was happy to have my 300 baud modem. So in looking at SEO and the engines behind it, and it's interesting to watch where all these technologies have matured, but the thing to remember, whether you're talking Amazon, Facebook, any, any mm -hmm. of these social media platforms, they're not there for your benefit. They're there to harness and gather data mm -hmm. about the people that use it so they can sell and market to them. So you have to know that game. Um, sorry. SEO. Oh, SEO. Uh, search engine optimization. And it actually stretches beyond that when you start talking about search engines. Uh, you know, we're all familiar with Google and Yahoo and all the usual big players. Um, well, Facebook and Amazon both are large SEO organizations into and of themselves for their own products and their own services. So when you're in there and you're dealing with them, you have to know they're going to change the game on you regularly. And part of that is they know that if they change the game and the algorithms regularly, they're going to force those people using them to for shell out more cash. Mm -hmm. We've heard a lot about Amazon recently because first of all, Amazon just bought Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. And according to Amazon's 10K filings, they acquired Whole Foods and started dropping prices on food. So it, it, it's not gonna become Whole Paycheck anymore. They're dropping that. So my question I guess would be to you guys, what do you think they'll do to the book industry? Well, all right, and I'll add something about that because the first thing that they came out and said was, we're dropping prices because we don't need to profit on Whole Foods. Yeah. Okay, so that is their, that has been in their industry attitude. They started in books, they started in publishing, 
their attitude is we don't have to profit we just have to break even and then they're still generating volumes of cash they can reinvest in other stuff they barely break even though on paper on paper yeah but well the 10k they barely again 20k a year it's only profit there are all kinds of ways to do legal creative mm -hmm. accounting when you get that big. There you go. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, they're actually talking about, Amazon's actually talking about putting uh, lockers in Whole Foods. So if you buy a product from them and you want to return it or you want to grab a product, you can literally go to your Whole Foods. And for those of us who are all, I presume we're all readers, since you're here, if you want to grab a book, it goes to your Whole Foods. Then you go to Whole Foods, and then you end up grabbing your book, and of course you're at Whole Foods, so there's a wine shop and a beer store and all that crap. Well, I think the other thing, you know, you asked what are, what, what's Amazon going to do f to books. Well, I think we had this fight, you know, with the Amazon Hachette battle a couple of years ago, yeah. and those of us who um, publish with uh, divisions of Hachette and I'm published with Orbit Books, uh, got to live that out firsthand, which was so much fun not. <laughs> um, and that's where Amazon said, we want to control w how much you charge for ebooks. And Hachette, on behalf of the industry, said, no, you don't. It's our business. We get to pick. Now, I'm not a big fan of paying the same hardcover price for an ebook that you pay for a hardcover. But their point was, it's our business. We should get to set the prices. Amazon and Hachette. Um, decided to have a kerfluffle over this, and Amazon decided to hold the Hachette authors basically hostage and said, well, then we'll make your books essentially unavailable on Amazon. You can't get the print books now for two to three weeks. Um, and, oh, well, we will sell you the Kindle book, but uh, since these books are unavailable, wouldn't you like to order a book instead from these authors whose books you can get now? We're just, we just write books. We don't have any sway on what the publisher does about the pricing. So we were essentially held hostage. And, uh, you know, it was not a fun time to be trying to sell books. Hachette act kind of won, sort of, in that they still get to set their pricing, but it took it out of the hide of a lot of us who it was, it was missed them and, sales in that time. It was them and uh, who else battled them? It was one of the major publishers that battled yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. And that publisher lost, if I recall correctly. Well, there was the first round that they um, said was actually a restraint of trade or collusion, where all of the publishers got together and kind of decided what ebooks should cost. That didn't work for the Rockefellers in the oil industry. It shouldn't work for anybody. That, that is illegal. Then they came back around and said, now wait, okay, we, we aren't going to get together as a group and set the prices, but we ought to be able to pick the price, not Amazon, for our own goods. And that's where Hachette won, but it it hurt a lot of authors in the meantime who yeah. missed out on sales because our books were essentially unavailable in print for that whole six month period. Now, was that unavailable in print from you guys or unavailable from Create Space? Unavailable in print from Orbit, which is one of the top five New York publishers. They they didn't completely delist the books, but they said. The, if you want this in Kindle, we'll sell it to you right now. If you want to get the print version, it'll take two to three weeks. Well, you know Amazon shoppers there. They want it, you know, in two days. Yeah. Um, now, it was still available through Barnes & Noble and Waterstones and Books A Million. It was in bookstores. But for the Amazon portion of the readership that wanted their print book day after tomorrow, it would take two to three weeks. And so there were a lot of lost sales over that. Now, we can all agree, as far as panelists are concerned, that Amazon is the big dog, correct? Today. Today, yeah. Again, their profit margins are so low, I'm surprised they're still in business. That being said, one of the trends that I'm seeing in publishing right now, and it's been going on for about a year or so, give or take. A little longer. The 99-cent book. Or... If you jump onto Amazon, was it the Kindle Boards? Kindle Unlimited? Uh, no, their the, the forum. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. There's an Amazon forum, and one of the trends that I'm seeing is the 99 cent book, or what they call perma free. So, first of all, let you guys uh, explain perma free, and then how you guys react to that. Um, you want to go first? Um, I mean, I can speak to kind of one of the things that comes up a lot in social media marketing, and I think it's in true of thinking about is Amazon going to be the big guy or should we care about how they're changing their search algorithm, is creating your tribe. I know you were talking about this in the tech startup panel earlier, and it's something I think is really true, whether you're a writer, anybody's trying to sell your work anywhere now because everything's digital, is 
not just relying on Amazon or not just relying on Google or Facebook or whatever the platform is to sell your work. It's about building your community in all the places where your community is online so that you can capture their information and keep selling directly to them. Um, and I think the, the perma-free or the ver very inexpensive books for a lot of writers who sell that way tends to be more of a lead generation tool to, to get those people to buy the one thing very cheaply or to get it for free. And then you can start pulling them into your inner circle and market to them for other products. So like, this is my only book, right? I'm not making my money off of books exclusively, but what I can do is that this can be a low cost entry point for someone to find themselves to find my work and then I have other products like online courses or other things that I can do, um, teach in-person workshops to artists and creatives. So that I think that's a way that some people are using the less expensive books to market more things than just the books themselves. They can have other products that can make money in different ways. Well, well I think, oh, oh, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, it, again, it's a matter of what are, you, what are you selling for? What are you trying to do? If it, and I've seen a lot now where, especially with the perma-free and the 99 cents, readers are becoming better educated and recognize that if this is a brand new release that's on perma-free and that's the only book they've got, it, you know, you can really question how good the quality is. I, you know, and I've seen a lot of the forums and a lot of the feedback coming back from your hard readers going, I know I'm getting what I'm paying for. Where I think you see KD, you know, Amazon KDP Select, and KP, you know, unlimited and all this coming through. We're seeing readers want to pay less and less for books, but I think they also are now recognizing that you get the quality you pay for. I think it depends on how you intend to use perma-free as a strategy. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a couple of friends who use who have uh, put the first book in their series as perma-free and they offer it as an inducement to join their email newsletter, they offer it as an inducement to sign up for their pages so that they create that long-term relationship with readers. And the goal there is to suck people into the rest of the series. And these are folks who, who are full-time working writers. Um, so for some people that is a strategic measure. Uh, but these are also folks who have a large body of work, so it's not their first rodeo, it's not their only book. So in a case like mine, where I've actually got 60 plus titles out, this kind of works out. But my question with that would be, so you're trying to, first of all, are we trying to establish a large newsletter base? Because what I'm seeing right now is the big thing as far as marketing for those of us who want to be professional and want to be paid and want this to be our primary source of income. I'm seeing a lot of authors who've got thousands of subscribers. And in that list of thousands of subscribers, you've got, obviously, with, with someone like Tim Ferriss who says, you only need a thousand people to be diehard fans, right? If you've got a million fans on your newsletter subscriber list, that first thousand, they're gonna buy, they're gonna talk you up. Are we trying, really, at this point, to build the numbers on our newsletter list, and how does it matter? So I am a firm believer in newsletter lists, but we have to recognize what they're good for and recognize that there's a cost to using them. Mm -hmm. um, we only really want people on our newsletter lists that are going to open them, going to read them, and going to be true fans. Because there is a cost to, to generating newsletters. I mean, there's a cost to subscribers. You know, the more you're sending out, you start getting into a cost. It's a time cost, too. Mm -hmm. and, and there is definitely a time cost. Um, now, I, and like I say, I use this little novella is a gateway drug that has worked out very well for me in getting readers um, and I say this because I and I, I will do the pitch I will say this is a murder mystery somebody's killing gnomes and turning them into garden statuary and I have told <laughs> Dude, I love that idea. and I, I, I told the full story that goes behind it and I, but I will sell a ton of these I even give you know give some away and whatnot and I give away the ebook version of it and then they come and they, they've got to have the rest of the series they got to get the rest of them know what your gateway drug is, but email lists are very good for certain things, certain products. Physical th products that you're generating on. I think the other thing to remember with email lists is if all of your contact with your readers or your base is through social media, through Facebook, through Twitter, if those sites go away tomorrow, you have no way to contact those people. Those connections don't belong to you. 
If you have an opt-in list where people have given you permission to remain in touch with them, and that's essential because it's against the law to just add them without their permission, but if you have an opt-in <coughs> list, that list belongs to you. Now you can move that list from one newsletter site to another. Um, that, that isn't going to just disappear on you. And there's a saying in the small business side of things that your list is your retirement. In other words, the, the list of people who are those true fans and that list that you own is your money maker. And, but, and again, that's where you want to have your true fans. You don't want to be, and that's where the risk is with giveaways is, mm -hmm. oh, I gave away a free book to get somebody on my list and they never read an email again. I don't want those guys on my list. And that's why it's better to give away, though, a free book than like a free Kindle or a free iPad. I mean, I've seen people do crazy things on giveaways. Yeah, people will sign up to win a free Kindle, but that doesn't mean they're interested in your book. They just wanted the free Kindle. If, on the other hand, the inducement is you get a free short story of mine, you get a free novella of mine, you get a free book, well, okay, some people are hoarders. They'll sign up for anything that's free. But it's more likely that if they sign up for it, they may actually be interested uh, as opposed to just some expensive doodad. And the mm -hmm. caveat to that, if you're giving away a free short story or novella, is the story itself needs to really be well written. It doesn't have to be the best story in the world. Because remember, we're not trying to write the great American pick your genre novel. That shit don't sell. Nobody cares about the great American anything other than literary folks. And you guys wouldn't be here if y'all were literary. <laughs> really wouldn't be. But that being said, if that, so for me, for example, if I read a story, because I go through a lot of emails getting concerning the um, free stuff, because, and I'll cover this in a second, I'll ask you about this in a second, there's a lot of newsletters out there that promise you great books either for free or very, very cheap, usually 99 cents. That being said, if the opening lines of that story don't grab my attention, and it's, for me, having been in the industry for 20 years almost, it's the first two lines. But someone in this panel may be a little more, um, what do you call it, less judgmental. Maybe it's the first page, right? Mm -hmm. If that first page doesn't grab you, why would I bother continuing on? There's going to be an author on a panel here later on, E.J. Stevens. Um, her first novel that I read last year was her Ivy Grangey series, and literally, I don't read YA. I actually think it's immoral for me personally, based on who I am, to read YA. And those of you who know me after the panel will understand why. But that being said, those first opening lines were fantastic. And that's why I continued to finish the book and grab the next one in the series. So that being said, how do you guys feel about promoting that first book? And what do you guys recommend to do when you put that first book out there, either for very, very cheap or for perma-free? Well, let me, let me jump back on that 99-cent book perma-free thing uh, for just a second. There is a middle ground between charging full price for your book and giving it away for free, and that is the periodic sale. Everybody likes a sale, right? So there are services out there like BookBub and Promo Cave and eReader Daily uh, and a host of others that um, you can, as an author, sign up for, pay a fee to be featured on for a period of time, and those services have subscribers who want to get these book bargains. Uh, now, I heard the people who own BookBub uh, speak at Book Expo a couple of years ago, and they were talking about their strategy. BookBub is a service you can sign up for, and you get free books. Um, and as, an, as an author, you have to actually be approved for them. You have to be approved. There's a fee, um, I think in some cases at least. And, yeah, it's a, it, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's yeah, it's a, it's an expensive fee, and um, you, they give uh, your book away for free for a period of time. What the BookBub people said was, they know that a lot of the people who sign up for their services are uh, retired, fixed income. They they don't have the money. You know, they've already gotten all their books off the. Um, used bookstore and their uh, neighbors' shelves and the yard sales and they're voracious readers, but they read 
hundreds of books a year. This is the person that may not have the income to buy every new book that's out, but everybody who knows them asks them for book recommendations because they know that they are omnivorous. And these so, people read four to five books a week. Or more. Yeah. I mean, we're talking maybe more than one book a day, depending on the genre. So that's the, the benefit for a book bob is your book goes into those people's hands and they're the one everybody on their block asks for recommendations. Now personally, I was I did a promotion uh, back in July where my biggest sales jump happened through I Love Vampire Novels and that's because they have a targeted list of like, I want to say a million readers who are die hard paranormal fans. No pun intended. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. They are. They, they they literally grab everything out there. My my sales went from one forty four thousand in Kindle to twenty two k, literally like that in a day. So um, how do you guys feel about using the marketing services and paying for that? I think if you found somebody else who has the right type of audience that you're trying to reach, then if it's tar super targeted, it's totally worth it. It's just a matter of what's the return on investment going to be as far as what you're actually putting out in terms of the advertising dollars versus what you think you're going to get back. But yeah, tapping into somebody else's existing audience is always going to be a quicker way to get your work in front of that audience than for you to organically build that audience up yourself. Yeah, and I mean, if you're looking at advertising is advertising. We have a lot of media that exists purely to have you know, something for you to watch the advertising. You know, every show on TV, every service, advertising works. So if, you know, like you say, the ROI and making a conscious decision as to where you want to advertise, but in this market, in this market, uh, <laughs> just testing, ROI, make sure you're awake. ROI is defined as return on investment, and in this particular case, for most of us, it's return on investment of time spent writing that book. Well, and to it, me anyway. Well, think about it. If I've spent so something I publish, you know, you've got a minimum of thirty-five hundred bucks tied up in if you've done any quality editing, covers everything else. So when you you spent that money, and the time, you know, the hundreds of hours, and you've gone through and invested all of that, if you want people to see it, you're going to have to crank some money out for people to notice it the next phase. The question is, where does it make sense, and how much? If you were running any other kind of business, and if you're if you're in this to make money, if you want to be a full-time writer, then you have to treat this as a business. But if you were selling any other kind of product or service, you'd be setting a certain amount of your income aside, and recommendations run anywhere from 20 to 30 percent, to pay for marketing. And you'd be looking for compatible advertising sites, organizations that are reaching the audience, you, all, you have a targeted product or service to. It's exactly the same way with books. Now, I'll mention real quick, one of the things that was cool for me was I took a Facebook marketing course a few weeks ago, and it was by Sherry, again, her name is Wojcik. I know I'm butchering that, and I apologize when she sees this video for her butchering her name. But anyway, she was talking about literally when you boost a post on Facebook, seven bucks a day, or for a week. And all you're doing is posting your most popular post, and that's it, seven bucks. Now, for those of you who are hobbyists, I want to know, first of all, the hobbyists, show your hands, and I want to know, what do you guys want? Do you want exposure? Do you want ratings? What do you want? Tell me. Okay, what else? I guess we'll go with exposure then. So, for those of us who are, because we've been doing this for a long, long time, how do you get that exposure free? Um, so from a free standpoint, I don't believe there is such a thing as free. You're expending some resource, even if that's just your time. If you're spending your time becoming educated on getting your message out, if you're spending time creating ma messages, crafting messages, doing all the rest of this, there is no such thing as free. Now if you're saying about not spending money, cranking right. the dollars out the door, um, that takes time. I mean, social media, the organic reach does not exist like it used to. Uh, God, no. You can spend a lot of time on social media, but even so, you're, you're better spent to build time and connections in groups. Mm -hmm. 
I think that going to the Facebook groups or going to other social media groups and spending time engaging with that community and building relationships with people so they become your evangelists. So my question then would be, where is your best ROI on time spent for the free folks? I like Facebook personally. Twitter's become cucked, right. but I that's me. But Facebook works for me. But these folks have a different response. I, I have a question. It was brought up like Give the box. I hate that box. You know what? Let's do the making loud It does. I hate that box. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I had a question. It's you. I'm a big fan of YouTube and BookTube, mm -hmm. and how does that impact you guys? Because I love that. Like that's where I get a lot of my book recommendations. And I don't know, is it, is that something you guys put any work into, or is that like that organic kind of reach? I do actually. So one of my authors is actually a fan of oh the wine guy, Gary Vaynerchuk. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and he began giving out a lot of free information on YouTube, how to market and become a YouTuber. And I, this week's been a really uh, cluster frack. Yeah, I can say that, yeah? All right. Cluster frack week because I had the girlfriend over an investment seminar and all kinds of other crap, plus Dragon Com. But normally, I do a YouTube video once a week where I literally just talk about, for authors, I talk tips on writing every Wednesday. My YouTube channel, every Wednesday, I do YouTube where it's writing tips or honestly, What's going on? Uh, you guys, uh, some of you might have seen me talking about the, key the ketones, and I'm talking about biohacking as a writer and how that affects my writing career. And it takes time. But you can literally, with your iPhone, record a video in the proper lighting and get that uh, upload to YouTube and just start building that. And over time, and then of course, on the positive side of that, if you're not me, or these guys, you can potentially monetize your videos and at some point eventually after you've got a big enough audience, make some money off of that. But you're primarily just getting your message out on YouTube. Works for me well. There you go, right there. There's your video camera. There's your entire production set. Uh, Sasha Ilyevich. I-L-L-Y-V-I-C-H. I mean, for some people, it's YouTube. For other people, it's audio podcasting. Um, some people, it's blogging. You know, I've seen people build huge audiences because they were blogging not necessarily about their book, but they were blogging about something related to their book. So, for example, if you absolutely love to cook and you have a cooking blog and people love to follow you and, and hear all about your cooking adventures or misadventures, and, oh, you do a cozy mystery series that's all about a chef who cooks in New Orleans, well, you know, a certain percentage of the people who love your voice on the blog and love the you they've met there are probably going to jump over and at least give one of your books a shot. And you're not going to hard sell. I do occasionally hard sell, but most of it is, is my BS, literally. It's everything from the days when I'm doing really well, my high word count, to the days where I'm like hammered as hell and I've had a really bad day and my mind is in that depressive field and I talk honestly because people who watch your YouTube channel or see you in audio are going to try to connect and relate. And actually, if I may, give a shout out to Hold On To The Light. Mm -hmm. Can we do that? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Oh, OK. Um, Hold On To The Light is a blogging campaign uh, with uh, authors talking about mental health uh, and fandom to stand in solidarity with fans and reduce stigma. We had over 100. Uh, science fiction and fantasy authors last year who blogged uh, and talked very candidly about all aspects, uh, suicide, depression, self-harm, anxiety. We're gearing up for a new campaign with new blog posts this year. You can find links to all of those posts at holdontothelight.com. And uh, please pass it on. It's, it's been a terrific uh, experience. I've been running Tim Ferriss and Vishen Lakhiani from Mind Valley uh, on that regularly because it's an issue that affects me directly even though I won't admit it, even though I just did. So, I mean, you know, it's a great campaign, but it's actually important because this industry is very much, when you go to write that book, y'all can agree, right? It's just you. It's you and whatever angels or demons are in your head, right? Yeah? Mm hmm Okay. So, um, I want to do Q&A with the audience. How's that? Sure. 
All right, so you guys have questions, I assume. Let's uh, do that, right? Uh, quick, quick, <laughs> quick question for Gail, your book. Is it oriented to all social media marketing or is it uh, author specific? No, it's a cross section. There is a chapter especially for authors, and I interviewed Rick Altieri and Brian Thomas Schmidt, um, among others, for some of their advice because they've done this very, very successfully. But there are also chapters in there for speakers and small business people and um, historians and family genealogists. How much is it? 17. And it is available in bookstores everywhere, but I do have some copies with me here at the con, and I'm happy to sell them to you and sign them for you. Which you will sign. Of course I'll sign them. <laughs> My, Mine. But yes, it, it has a broad exposure, and most of it is talking about social media strategy and how to play the game now. I've had her on panels for what four or five years now, at, at least, if about, not longer. and she's been really, really. Uh, what's the term? These 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 new generation kids, uh, uh, and fleek. She's on fleek. Thank you. You got another yeah, handbag. Yeah, yeah, me either. Me um, my questions for Jim. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a epic fantasy series already in motion, but I was thought about the prequel that you gave out. You know, I was thinking, well, maybe cheap or giveaway. I want the nuts and bolts. How did you, you know, how did you advertise it? How did you give it away? Did you have to mail each book to people? You know, how, exactly what did you do for that? I am shameless. <laughs> he really is. That's what's up. <laughs> That's what's up. Um... I will t all right, so last weekend, for example, I did Soda City Con with John Hartness and Matthew, and, uh, you know, talking about, and, and I'll loop back to your question in two seconds, but, you know, talking about don't do the hard sell, there are, it is very hard to do, but there's one person who does it extraordinarily well, and if you ever cross his path, John Hartness will come tell you, come buy my ship. That is his entire tagline, and people do. And it's hysterical, and it's fun to do a table with him. If you can get past him and say, yeah, I'm going to get your money first. Um, <laughs> now, I have done lots of things with this little novella. And if you, you – anything and everything. It's go out, and I've given away ebooks of it. I, I have put it out on Reddit. I have – I will tell this little story. A number of years ago, um, I had a, a piece of work that was floating around that had, you know, gotten ripped and, and was running around the torrent sites and whatnot – well, back in those days, it was a whole lot easier to intercept the file and then replic and then replace it with a different copy. I did something evil. I took the first two thirds of the book and left it out there, and then I put a link to Amazon with the last third of the book, and I said, "If you've enjoyed this, that's awesome. Go buy it here." Um, you know, there's sites like Wattpad that you can go out there and start and put your rough drafts out there and build an audience. Because those people will come buy your finished work when it's done and edited. They will give you feedback. Talking about free stuff, when you go out to some of these services, you can publish out there and publish your rough stuff. People will come and read it. Publish it on your website. Publish it in these different places. If you're trying to build a readership, the first hard pro problem you have is not somebody ripping you off. It's somebody knowing you, you exist. So go wherever you need to go. So the yeah. key is just to build your audience. You don't Oh, I've given out ebooks. I mean, I I I'm asking for a copy after we're done. Oh yeah. If you can give away the ebooks, you cut your costs tremendously. So yeah. you want to do as much of this digitally as you possibly can. Now, you mentioned doing prequels. Prequels can be a great way to lead into a series. Prequels can also be a way to keep people involved with a series when you've come to a resting point at a certain uh, space and you're going to pick up later. So my Chronicles of the Necromancer series ran six books. I do have another six books that will be starting next year. But it's been on hiatus for about five years while I did several other series. Um, we brought out the John Mark Mahanian's short stories and novellas, about 30 of those, in between, and they add up to three serialized novels that take place 15 years before the first book in the Chronicles series. That kept the readership engaged and kept them remembering who I was and who, what the series was in between the new releases of additional books. So, again, it's all about the strategy. 
and kind of the cool thing about this is, is because there's some, there's certain authors where so a lot of authors these days right now are doing the 99 cent thing, because even though the profit margin is low, it's like what 35 cents or something like that yeah. on Amazon. There are authors when they uh, put out a book. Carrie Adrian, for example, is a friend of mine, and she writes a bear shifter series. I don't really do bears. I'm a wolf guy. But that being said, and in Gail's case too, your books not that sense. Not the books, but a short story. You know, my ROI on a 99 cent short story isn't too bad for a 30 page short story. Right. For my 99 point, cents. My point is, though, is once I once she hooks me in, unless I'm flat, fracking broke, I'm buying her book because the writing is that good. And that's the key thing you want to take away from this at this point is is the, the writing needs to be really on point, uh, and Fleek is on point. For but um, apparently, according to youth, but that writing is, uh, is so good that yeah, I'm gonna spend that two or three ninety nine and grab that book. Well, and oh, and let me add one more thing. So, and I did I do this. So if I'm doing a show and somebody is dressed as a gnome, that's awesome. I will I will sign and give them a copy and take a picture of it. Well, last weekend I had a guy come by, dressed out with a you know hat was like twelve feet tall. He's carrying a basket full of candy, and I'm like, I gotta get a picture of this. And I did, I took it, and, like, and I signed the book to him, and he took a stack of cards, and he was going around passing out candy, and everybody that took candy also got a bookmark. So, the couple of bucks of investment of giving him a book, and you know, I'll run that picture on Twitter, you know, it's, a, it's what all the good gnomes are reading. Um, right. The advertising I'll get out of those pictures, and for him going around in a show and pushing all that, you know, something that gives you that hook to bring people in against shameless self-promotion. We <laughs> used to do business cards, and I, had, I used to drop flyers off in the rooms, at the dealer rooms and whatnot for Sizzler editions and all that crap. And that, that ROI, obviously, it's not on me because my publisher's paying for it. That's useless, sadly. Hey, it's hey, 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 hey. I'm getting or, to that. Or bookmarks instead. <laughs> so we both yeah, but but see, we're, they we're but they here. but they spend so little on those that their ROI is really high, and you really do want to focus as a businessman or a business person on the ROI there. Dropping off a thousand flyers in a dealer room doesn't do any good. Taking a picture with Gail or Jim or her, different story, different story. Well, because and, and they, 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 they could spread viral. And again, it comes back to your strategy for using the business card. We have a QR code on the back that takes you oh, to the that. website. We have all the ways you can get in touch with us uh, on the back of the card. You have my email address. So this is how this is how you make connections. And I don't just, as Sasha said, I don't leave these in racks in large numbers. I hand them out to people to seal a personal connection. And that's what really the social media thing is it's about personal connections. Part of the thing about me in particular is because I, I do go through the, my, my mood swings and whatnot, and Gail's been around for a minute with me, seeing me on social media ranting about how angry or upset that I am over some personal BS. Don't do that. You shouldn't, <laughs> but I've kind of built my reputation on that as, the, as the, initially the bad boy of romance and the gentleman playboy of romance as well. Um, my fans jump in and start asking what's wrong, and the people that actually read me, they not only care about the books, they care about the author. And you really want to build that connection. We have a back question, yes? Uh, yeah, I'm a uh, webcomics writer. I don't have much problem with uh, traffic on a, you know, but the thing is, uh, my conversion funnel uh, sucks. On a on a good day, 2,500 pe people walk through the website, but if nobody's buying anything, it doesn't do me my look of good. So I guess the question is, if you're on your website, uh, any advice for improving that uh, conversion funnel? Because one button that links to Patreon isn't doing a whole hell of a lot. Yeah, uh, and one button on a website that's hidden somewhere that says something about buying is not, that's not a good call to action, right? So like for my book, this is a very targeted audience. It's about craft shows, making money at craft shows. So one of the things that I have is multiple pieces of content stretched throughout my website that are all kind of top of funnel blog posts that show up in Google organic search when somebody searches about 
What do I need for a craft show? I have kind of bits and pieces of this book broken out into smaller blog posts that people can get for free that also have Amazon affiliate links so I can make money off of other people's Amazon products. And it gives them a lot of really useful information. And then throughout that post, I'm talking again and again multiple times about if you want more information, check out this book. If you want for inform in more information, check out this other course that I have. Right? You can't just stick a button somewhere and expect somebody to find it. They've got to have multiple points of entry further down the funnel that we call it in marketing. So you yeah. want your Facebook page, your fan page, your website, your Patreon, your blog, whatever you got to have that button labeled there in general? Well, and, and I'll, I'll add to that. So when you go and when you're building out a marketing page, so if I'm dealing with services side, um, if you're building out the page, you want it to be obvious about where to go for the call to action. The question is, do you give something in return for the call to action? In other words, if you sign up on my mailing list, do you get a free ebook or do you get something on those lines? Um, but yeah, if you're doing a web comic, you definitely should be doing affiliate marketing. You should be, you know, definitely, if nothing else, Amazon. You should have that splash running up there and going, getting the advertising going. I mean, there's a lot of things about monetization. I mean, one of the reasons you want to build the YouTube channel and you want to build those followings is because if you hit certain numbers then you can start to monetize that YouTube channel in addition to driving people and driving traffic to you your products everything else because again you need to can look at it and consider everything of this as a business I, I would also be curious like what other tools you're using to market the webcomic because I would think something like Instagram that's very visual could be helpful to market the comic and then in every single caption at the end have that call to action that you like it, you want to support us, go to our Patreon, there's my link in the profile, and that's what you're always driving people back to, is that way to support you financially. So you guys just saw me unwrap the cigar, because I'm going to smoke after this panel. Um, a buddy of mine who is uh, Cigar City Life on Instagram, every single video he posts on Instagram, he's smoking a cigar, at the very end of his, his post, his live video, he says, City of Cigar Life, it's a revolution, and links down below. So you want that call to action in every single post. Uh, and there's one other thing I want to add, and this is be very aware of this, is be, especially if you start running Facebook advertising, if you start running social media advertising, Facebook will bump your down the, down the, if you look and say, like my page, do this, do this, if you use some of that language that's very targeted, Facebook will actually bump you down the list because they want the likes and things to be organic. If you say, oh, there's a sale, buy my book, buy my book, buy my book you will get bumped down the algorithm because of doing the hard sell. You know, if you, if you say on sale, but you can do, th you know, you have to be very creative about your language when you're posting things on Facebook because the algorithm, if they think that you're making money but they're not getting any of it, they will suppress you. And I do want to add to that, so YouTube recently just banned or sort of knocking out, so I've got the Kekistani shirt on. Watch your language and watch your tags for most of you, this is probably not going to be an issue because most of you are probably pretty um, PC. But if you decide to go the route that I went, for example, and be a little more controversial, whether you start eliciting political views or views on different things, um, your tags on your videos and your blog posts, be mindful of those just because you might be right about whatever you're talking about but certain channels have certain uh, uh, mediums have their own rules and to you know, terms of service, so just watch out for that. I, th I think the number one rule is remember they're not there for your benefit. I'll get it with a lot of a lot of shit, but I've been doing this for twenty years, so that's me. You guys, Wait. I got a question. No, I think you've got the, you've got the cube. Yeah, well, that's because I've been waiting. Oh, yeah, well, okay, nice, man. <laughs> Going back to about ten minutes ago, <laughs> I like your comments about having that card. But one of the things about a business card is it should tell you your brand. I can't tell what your brand is based upon the last uh, what fifty minutes in this uh, panel. What is your brand? Depends on whether you're talking about my fantasy brand or my my social media brand. My brand with social media is making it understandable and easy for people who are not marketing professionals. Okay, so you're two, you're, you're different, uh, 
completely yeah. completely different businesses, completely different websites. It's just conventions generally have a social media track, and I've got knowledge on that that taps in because I'm here as an author as well. So, yes, there are two different sets of branding. And I have, in my simplicity, because I tout on my social media, I'm a diehard cigar smoker. I'm a diehard wine enthusiast. I'm a diehard foodie. They all relate. And they end up mixing with my writing. You know what you're getting when you pick up my book. But it's, it's easy. What you don't know is I also teach to writers. That's just because I don't, I don't push that. I, I let RWA and Savvy Authors and Coffee Time push that for me. I think we have a guy behind you. Question? Oh, come on, folks. You've got questions. Don't be shy. Yeah. So you guys mentioned earlier that there were complications with marketing on Twitter recently. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean... They banned Milo Yiannopoulos. Um, you know, for me it's less of a complication than just an observation, and that is that sometimes your metrics are difficult to link to sales. So I'm very, very active on Twitter. I'm part of a lot of conversations in some very active fandoms that I'm wholeheartedly a full fangirl of and enjoy being part of. Sasha's laughing, he knows. I've seen her on Twitter all the time. <laughs> I follow her. I love her posts. Um, and, and it's very wholehearted. It's, you know, my metrics are terrific. My my page impressions, my page visits, my uh, number of people adding me every month, my uh, all of those numbers are terrific. Can I always look at my sales figures for the month or my royalty statements and go, yes, I can see where I ran a Twitter campaign. I wish I could, but I can't always. What I can tell you anecdotally is that the relationships that have been built over months of tweeting back and forth on things that we share a love of, then people start going, I didn't know you wrote books. I, I, oh my gosh, I looked at your other tweets. Um, and they start retweeting them. They start asking. I've got folks from that group that are following me on my pictures. I'm tweeting from Dragon Con. Um, it, it's building a relationship based on a shared love. But a long time ago, John Wanamaker, the um, department store uh, magnet, said, I know 50% of my marketing is wasted. I just don't know which 50%. So if you're looking for this straight line, I ran a Twitter ad and my sales jumped 20%, I can't guarantee that you're going to see it, but I can tell you that sustained engagement over time builds your audience and sales. Now, one of the things that I saw recently with my marketing campaign was I did a campaign with, uh, have you guys done Tweet Your Book? Yes. Yes. Yeah, that actually began to uh, lower my sales rank on Amazon. It took a minute. I ran that campaign. It was 45 bucks for like what, 10 tweets a day, something like and, that. Yeah, and I ran that. Yeah, I ran that campaign for the entire month of July, and I noticed it's a slow decline in in, in uh, Amazon sales rank. So it does take time. And again, I had other campaigns going on. So why don't I ask you guys about that before we close? Um, so doing doing targeted campaigning with newsletter building and blogging and paying for the sites that have the things. How do you guys feel about that? And what do you guys feel is your best takeaway from that? I mean, it's it's all important. At the end of the day, I think the most important thing is thinking about who your audience is and where are those people, and then investing your time and money in finding them on the right channel. Because for some of us, Facebook might be the most popular place. For others, Instagram might be. For others, YouTube might be maybe podcasting. But there's only so much of it, especially a lot of writers are going to be single entrepreneurs by themselves doing a lot of the work by themselves, right? So you don't have infinite time to write and market every single channel, every single way. So if you're not getting the ROI on Twitter, then maybe put that on the back burner and find another place where your people are and really invest in that place and connecting with people there. Good point. Targeting ads is marketing 101. I mean, you don't want to just, it's not just about how massive your reach is, because if all of those people you're reaching don't buy books, 
then what's your point? You want to reach people who buy books, and not just any books, but the, the type of genre you write. So on Facebook, if I run an ad, I've very carefully targeted uh, people who read books by other authors who write things similar to what I write, because there's probably going to be some overlap there. On Twitter, it's going to be people who follow other authors or fandoms or podcasters or bloggers who cover the kinds of things that I write about. Um, that cuts down on the clutter and helps to guarantee that what I'm paying for gets out in front of people who really are potentially interested and might just not have discovered me yet. And you're, you're not shotgun blasting this, you're actually targeting to a very small minority, correct? Absolutely. And, and again, I think the other part of it is doing those things you resonate with. I have a definite hate-hate relationship with social media. Um, but as a general rule, I mean, on, on Facebook, I'm not that active because I, I, I have a life and I have stuff to get done and I probably should post more of it up there, but usually it's when I'm doing something stupid that entertains people and I frequently do stupid things. Um, or at least entertaining. <laughs> if you can't do anything else, be a bad example and a warning to others. Um, yes. But... You know, Twitter I'm fairly active on. Um, I've got different Twitter accounts for different purposes, but my, my general Twitter handle, I post, you know, I, I throw sales and stuff out there, and I post my stuff up every once in a while, but as a general rule, it's whatever shiny object I happen to be entertained by at that point. I do a lot of articles on anthropology. I do a lot of articles on, on sociology. I do a lot of, science, a, a lot of articles on science, on tech, because these are all areas I work in. These are all things that I do and deal with. Those are not all going to generate into readers or sales for me, but it's it's that's that's me sort of posting stuff out there into the group of people I interact with regularly. Um, for Facebook, again, I'm I'm I go through these cycles and I, I commit all the sins of social media of eh eh eh. Um, but it's the ultimate thing is building the community of people where you resonate and where you want to spend the time because social media can be an extraordinary time suck. Especially if you shit post. Now real quick, we've got about two minutes left. I want to get final thoughts from you starting first and I'll get my last. Just get started. If you're, if you're one of the hobbyists, just start. Like that was how I started this book. It actually evolved. It started out as a simple PDF book based on some blog posts I'd created. And then I had to figure out how to self-publish it into print form. And I, now I can say I published a book. So just start somewhere. <laughs> Get it done. I mean, it, it, if, you're not, if you're sitting and talking about it and going in cycles about it, nothing gets done. If you're worried about how to get there, you're better off to jump off that cliff and learn on the way down. Some days you're not going to build wings, but at the same time, you're not going to learn until you're actually trying to do it. Now, and I would also encourage continue to educate yourself because everything changes on a daily basis. Be present and consistently engage. I tweeted during this panel that I was having a great time at the EFF forum and picked up two people who just followed me on Twitter, and that's how it's built. And my last thing about this, as far as I'm concerned, advice to you guys, as I've already said, just do it. If you don't jump, you're never going to learn to fly. So that's my advice. Jump off the cliff. Now, I see you. Go ahead. That's cool. Think about the people who are likely to like what you do and what else they like. So if you're an author, think about what other kind of books are similar to yours. And if people like those books, they probably read yours. If you've got a product, well, what else do people who need that product use? What are their other interests? And target those other interests. And you're kind of like a Venn diagram with the overlapping circles. That middle piece that overlaps is going to be your audience. Kind of the big question I would ask myself if I were you is, who the hell are you? And that being said, like, what do you like? What do you do? And those things are going to get you. How do you find people that you want to target? Well, again, um, again, who who are you? What do you like to do? What do you like to read? What do you like to to you know be a part of? What do you care about? And we're going to be talking about niche marketing in ebooks and print for writers on Monday at 11:30, right here. So Excellent. Come back then. So I've got to close this up. So first of all, again, you guys know I want a large, large, large. I want deafening. Please thank my panelists. Yay!
I can't hear you. Wonderful.